Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Barbara Krauthammer, Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm really happy to have this chance to welcome you um, to our first event in the Faculty Works series. The HFA Faculty Works series is designed to bring together faculty from our College of Humanities and Fine Arts at UMass Amherst in conversation with distinguished scholars and artists to address interesting and new research and to present it to a broad audience. By exploring the work of our distinguished faculty in this series, we seek to affirm the importance of the arts and interdisciplinary inquiry and scholarship for uncovering and exploring new dimensions of the human experience. The focus of today's event will be the new book by Professor Monica Schmitter. Professor Schmitter's book is titled The Art Collector in Early Modern Italy. Andrea Odoni and his Venetian Palace, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021. Professor Schmitter is professor and chair of the Department of the History of Art and Architecture. She's a specialist in Italian art of the late 15th and early 16th century Venice. And in addition to her new book, Professor Schmitter has also published many articles in journals such as Renaissance Quarterly, the Burlington Magazine, Renaissance Studies, and the Journal of Architectural Historians. She's a highly decorated and esteemed scholar who's received numerous fellowships and grants, including a visiting senior fellowship at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the National Gallery in 2012, the Samuel H. Kress Foundation grant from the Renaissance Society of America in 2011, the Gaddis Kreeble Foundation grant for study in Venice and the Veneto, um, multiple instances of receiving that grant, 2011, 2004, and 2000. The Villa Itati Fellowship from the Harvard University Center for the Italian Renaissance Studies in Florence, Italy from 2000 and 2001. And so we're really pleased that Monica has agreed to join us as the first presenter in this HFA Works series. Before we begin, I want to thank our co-sponsors with the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. I want to thank the Department of Classics, the Department of the History of Art and Architecture, and the Kinney Center for Interdisciplinary Renaissance Studies, as well as our History Department here at UMass. I also want to give special thanks um, to the staff working behind the scenes to make everything happen for us tonight. Um, Kathy Randall and Sarah Gibbons, we owe a big thanks to both of you. And now I'm happy to turn things over to Professor Marjorie Rubright. Marjorie is Associate Professor of English, and she's a highly distinguished scholar herself, and she's Director of the Kinney Center for Interdisciplinary Renaissance Studies here at UMass, where she's made a tremendous impact in the field in bringing together scholars and members of a wider academic and artistic communities. So without any further ado, Marjorie, I will turn things over to you for the rest of the evening. Thank you, Barbara. So welcome. Uh, I'm here to offer you a little bit of a map about how we'll be um, moving through our journey with Monica tonight. <clears throat> this evening, we'll first be hearing from Monica and then we'll open up into a conversation with Patricia Brown and David Young Kim, both of whom I'll introduce briefly before they speak. We have scheduled 10 minutes at the conclusion of this panel to consider your questions. So, as Monica speaks and as our distinguished guests speak, please submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I will capture your questions and convey them uh, to Monica, Pat, and David um, at the conclusion of our panel tonight. Please also keep your eye on the chat as there will be links to books and other relevant information there throughout the program. So with that, Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marjorie, and thank you, Barbara, very much for that introduction. And um, I also want to thank Jason Morley, who, with his cap of Associate Dean of Research, has really um, had this idea in the first place and has seen it through to the end. And to my friend, Christy Anderson, who really encouraged me to actually do it. 
And uh, also thanks to Sarah and Kathy and Julia Bender for the work behind the scenes. And finally, of course, to Pat and David for participating and Marjorie for coming in at the last minute to be the moderator. Finally, I'll just give a shout out to my colleagues in the Department of History of Art and Architecture. Um, I appreciate all of your support. And finally, to everybody who is here tonight, uh, it's wonderful that you could be here and I'm really honored that you could join us. So I have 10 minutes to talk to you about my 325 page book. Um, so I was thinking, what would I wanna hear from an author if I went to such an event? And I think what I wanna hear is uh, an overview of the book and what the author thinks are its most important contributions. So that is what I am intending to do um, now. So I do have some images to go along with my discussion. So I'm gonna share my screen. So um, this painting um, by the Venetian artist Lorenzo Lotto is, uh, depicts the Venetian citizen Andrea Odoni. And it is really the starting point and the ending point of my research. The starting point, because the portrait is what first got me interested in studying collecting in the first place. And the ending point, because it is in fact the subject of the last chapter of the book. And um, it is also the jumping off point for what I hope will be my next major research project. Over the course of my work, the complexity, the unusualness, and in the end, the quite extravagant claims made by the portrait became clearer to me. Ultimately, the project became a book about Odoni himself, his place in Venetian society, his house, and his collection. But why write a book about this man, other than the fact that he had this rather fabulous portrait painted of himself? Sorry, I'm having a little real estate problem here on my screen. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first, because there was really, an, uh, there is an amazing confluence of sources that have enabled me, even though neither Odoni's house nor his collection survives intact, to imaginatively reconstruct the, its original contents, its decoration, and even to some degree, its layout. Uh, it's quite remarkable to have that amount of detail about a single house in the early 16th century. So I think we could say that it is a very thick case study. One of the surviving sources is in fact a letter written to Odoni by the famous or maybe infamous is the better word writer Pietro Aretino. In this letter Aretino ostensibly compliments Odoni on his lavish houses and house and furnishings but not without a hint of sarcasm. The central conceit of the missive is that Odoni's house is a representation of the man himself a kind of parallel to the actual portrait by Lotto. And my book, in a sense, takes Aretino up on this idea by investigating who Odoni was through the things he owned and how he displayed them. Another reason to study Odoni is that he is an unexpected collector. He was not a member of the Venetian ruling elite, the patriciate. Instead, he was a member of a class that was unique to Venice, the cittadini or citizens, who were disenfranchised, but still often quite well-educated, esteemed, and or wealthy. Odoni's father was a wealthy immigrant from Milan, while his mother came from an established cittadino family. He was therefore both an insider and an outsider in Venetian society, which I think played an important role in his ambition and willingness to be daring and different, as indeed the for portrait itself forcefully conveys. While this is not the very first portrait in Italian art to depict a man with works of art, it is certainly the most complicated attempt to do so, both through the number and variety of objects that surround Odoni, but also through the pose, gesture, setting, and even the unusual dimensions of the canvas itself. With this portrait, Lotto, and through him Odoni, literally constructs the identity of a collector a identity which was really only in the process of formation at this time. And in fact, the word collector was yet not yet in use. 
I will come back to this portrait. The first two chapters of the book examine what it meant to be a cittadino in the early 16th century and Odoni's own family background and career. During this period, the cittadini were a more flexible, less defined group than later in the century. In this same period, Venice as a state was going through a transformation. Having lost its economic and political might, the city sought to reinvent itself as a cultural capital and a relatively egalitarian society. Odoni took advantage of these circumstances to seek distinction, although he was not a part of the ruling elite. The middle chapters of the book, chapters three through six, are like a tour of the house. As I studied the spaces, I was struck by how they differed from one another, as if projecting different facets of Odoni's character. The facade was frescoed in color with depictions of mythological gods, not unlike the surviving example or somewhat surviving example on the facade you see on the left. And on the right is a still extant balcony that was originally on Odoni's house. Entering into the house, one encountered a courtyard with ancient and modern sculpture arranged in a somewhat haphazard manner. I argue in imitation of collections in Rome like this one. Then one mounted the stairs to the Piano Nobile, entering that characteristically Venetian space, the Portigo. Here, Odoni displayed paintings with moralizing subjects, as well as more sculpture. Off the Portico were two sumptuous camere, the bedrooms, which were also important living spaces. One of the camera had Camere had an attached studiolo, a collecting and study room, like the one seen in the background of this painting by Carpaccio. This was where Odoni kept and shared with visitors smaller, precious, and curious objects like the ancient uh, late antique ivory, previously owned by a pope on the left, and examples of naturalia like bizarre fish and even a crocodile. If the one camera conveyed Odoni's wide ranging intellectual curiosity. The other room put a different, different interests on display. In this room, there were mostly images of women, including a reclining female nude that he could view while laying in bed. This was the room where Odoni displayed his portrait, the subject of the last chapter. chapter. I understand the portrait to be a meta commentary on the activity of collecting and the role of art in relation to religious devotion. Much of the chapter is about the painter Lotto and how he combined his interests in alchemy, hieroglyphs and religious reform in this complex and innovative portrait. In the, this image, Lotto shows us how images and material things can be stepping stones to the divine. Unlike earlier scholars who have seen an opposition between the small but gold crucifix Odoni displays in his left hand and the pagan antiquities that surround him, I think instead Lotto is proposing that natural materials made by God, transformed by humans into art, can be the path, can lead to Christ. This elevates collecting, somewhat paradoxically, into a means of transcending materiality of transmuting body or material into spirit. Obviously, there's a lot more to be said about this portrait, but I can't really go into more details, but of course you can always read the book. So moving on to what I see as the key contributions. Um, one of the contributions is certain, certainly to the study of Cittadini as a um, group. Although it's focused on one cittadino, I think it has larger implications for our understanding of the class. And I think generally that they have been sort of underrated. They're often seen as imitating the nobles, um, but actually I think they had their own ways of seeking distinction and they did not all do it in the same way. Ojoni was rather remarkable in using the novel practice of collecting to do so. This book is also about how identity was created through things in the Renaissance, or as modern theorists propose, how things create identity. The idea that consumption was an important aspect of self-fashioning in the Renaissance is often stated, but I am really able to analyze how this worked in a particular case. 
There were conflicting attitudes about consumption in this period and works like Odoni's portrait in particular need to be seen as interventions into these debates. The book third, the book contributes to our understanding of how works of art and other objects were displayed and combined in Venetian houses. I put Odoni's example in context with comparative material showing instances where he found followed general practice, but also where he diverged. In particular, I demonstrate a shift in practices and display of antiquities in 16th century Venice from the more found object and faux antiquity aesthetic that Odoni favored to the later more organized and programmatic display that developed later in the century. Finally, the last two contributions have to do with my reading of the portrait. I see my analysis of Odoni's portrait as part of the ongoing re-examination of uh, the response of Italian artists to contemporary demands for religious reform. Although there was not direct iconoclasm in Italy, there was what Alex Nagel has called soft iconoclasm. That is a critique within the works themselves of the role of art in devotion. Although Doni's portrait is not itself a religious work of art per se, it engages these themes interestingly and unexpectedly in the context of a portrait. And finally, I would say that I have created a new interpretation of this much discussed and very famous Renaissance painting. In doing so, I have also shown new light on the painter Lotto. In much of the English language literature, he comes across as a pious and somewhat simplistic artist, but more in line with Italian scholarship, I demonstrate that Lotto was grappling with some of the more arcane and syncretic ideas of his time, engaging them not in written texts, but with paint on canvas. Okay, I will stop there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Monica. I wanna remind the audience to take a moment now that Monica has shared with us her key contributions for, to, from this um, beautiful book to think about and post some questions in the Q&A feature. Um, while you do, it is my pleasure to introduce Patricia Fortini Brown, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University. She is the author most recently of The Venetian Bride, Bloodlines and Blood Feuds in Venice and the Venetian Empire. Among her many awards and honors, she received the Paul Oscar Christeller Lifetime Achievement Award by the Renaissance Society of America in 2020. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Um, I guess, okay. <laughs> you know, it's uncanny how many of my observations parallel those of, of uh, Monica. So it's great minds are in the same place. <laughs> Uh, first of all, my congratulations to Monica Schmitter for a most engaging art historical detective story. But of course, this impressive book is much more than that. Although much has been written about Lotto's portrait um, by, of, of, Andrea, of Andrea Odoni, Monica provides a much broader and deeper investigation of the sitter himself and of the mind of the artist that produced it than we've seen heretofore. Indeed, she peels back the layers from public to private and offers several overlapping portraits of the Venetian Cittadino as a cast, of the birth of collecting in Venice, of Odoni's house and collection of art and antiquities, and ultimately, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of Odoni himself. The reader is first introduced to the labile, often ambiguous world and fraught identity of the affluent Cittadino in Venice neither patrician nor popular. Having laid this foundation, Schmitter moves on from the Cittadino in general to this Cittadino, Odoni in particular. Here she shows us the human side of Venetian history with a meticulous reconstruction of the lives of Odoni and his uncle Francesco Zio from a handful of tax declarations, archival documents, uh, and an incomplete last will and testament, all contextualized with analogies to other figures of the time. Schmitter reveals how family networks worked, how the tax system worked, how state office holding worked, how tax collecting worked, all this in vivid personalized terms. In sum, she makes Odoni's world come alive. 
We then come to Odoni's Casa di Stazio. Now, this is a house tour worthy of HGTV. Unfortunately, the, ho the original house no longer exists in any recognizable form, and Schmitter had to reimagine it from a handful of early notices and comparative material. The most important among these were Michiel's Notizia of 1532, which initially piqued her interest in the project, I think, uh, Pietro Aretino's letter of 1537, and an invaluable 1555 notarial inventory made 10 years after Odoni's death of the, of the contents, room by room, without which this book couldn't have been written. These were augmented by the letter from uh, by a letter from Paolo Minuzio to his son Aldo in 1572 that focused on the house's shortcomings. For example, a dark kitchen, quote, where it is always night, unquote, and a garden with bad air. And by an 1829 visit by Emanuele Cicogna, who, who identified the location of the house, albeit then devoid of its original furnishings, after which it was completely transformed or torn down altogether. In a textbook example of historical reconstruction, Schmitter quite skillfully refurnishes Odoni's house by sorting through and reassessing these fragments. The house tour begins with the facade of which virtually nothing survives except part of a beautiful stone balcony, which you just saw, carved with tritons and nereids that now adorns a house across town in Conoregio. According to early sources, the facade itself was originally adorned with figurative frescoes by Girolamo da Treviso, a, quote, chorus of gods, unquote, with flying pudi, and perhaps the Graces, perhaps Apollo and Minerva, perhaps Venus, and almost certainly ba Bacchus and Ceres. In some, allusions to abundance, fertility, charity, generosity, and possibly references to Odoni's position in the Dazio del Vin as a collector of taxes on wine. Schmitter, Schmitter concludes that the facade was, quote, Odoni's most public portrait and a statement of his citizenship. He ornamented the ornamented the city without explicitly flaunting his personal and familiar wealth, unquote. And then we enter the house. Now, this is not a typical ground floor androne of a Venetian residence. We step into Odoni's Antigaia, a passageway leading to a courtyard, both spaces adorned with an impressive collection of statuary, both antique and modern. Marble busts, fragments, reliefs, legs, arms, figures, displayed presumably in emulation of a Roman style sculpture garden. Alas, most of this collection was dispersed, but Schmitter makes a heroic attempt to track down any survivors. In that regard, I was particularly intrigued by a wellhead noted by Chaconia. We might consider this a kind of faux antiquity with a relief decoration of all antica masks and foliate garlands and a Latin inscription dated 1533. Alas, it too has gone missing, although one hopes that it might turn up at some point, perhaps in a garden in the United States or the UK or even Hungary, where many Venetian wellheads ended up. Venetian wellheads, even very plain ones, became sought after collector's items um, after running water was brought into the city in the mid 19th century. And now let's go upstairs where we entered the portico the main space of family representation and an extension of the garden museum below. With more sculpture, 12 paintings, and even a restelliera, a rack displaying helmets and weapons, it was a further expression of Odoni's aristocratic pretensions. After the portico, we explore the rest of the house, room by room, based on the inventory and Michiel's note. Again, alas, most of the objects cited in Odoni's collection do not survive or cannot be identified with certainty. And again, Schmitter grapples with this issue valiantly and suggests possibilities and analogies, but we have to keep in mind that most identifications are speculative. The book culminates with a deep analysis of the Lotto portrait and Lotto's hermetic, religious, and philosophical interests in particular, which shaped his approach to portraiture. Schmetter argues, in my view successfully, that the portrait is an elaborate hieroglyph about contemplation, collecting, and art. She writes, quote, in the Odoni portrait, he sought to seamlessly combine narrative invenzioni and metaphoric imprese in one image, a portrait 
of a collector, unquote. I see this as more about Lotto, perhaps, than about Odoni, uh, whose commission simply provided Lotto with an opportunity to express his philosophical ideas pictorially. In some, Lotto's portrait becomes a genuine conversation between the sitter, the artist, and the viewer. The transcription and translation in the appendix of Pietro Aretino's letter to Odoni of 1537 is most welcome. And now it's time for the necessary quibble. Even with all the abundant footnotes and references, I would love to have had full transcriptions of the relevant sections of Michiel's Notizia, Odoni's incomplete will of 1545, and his brother Alvise's 1555 house inventory. But that would have made a long book even longer. These texts had been compiled by Georg Gronau from the notes of Gustav Ludwig uh, way back in, way back at the 100 years ago and published in 1911. And after considerable searching, voila, I found that some kind soul had uploaded the volume into Wikimedia Commons and made them available online. As an author, I know you can't think of everything, but next time around, please do include such a link in the autobiography. Finally, full disclosure, I was a reviewer of the manuscript for Cambridge Press twice over, and I was enthusiastic both times. One thing I noted, uh, noticed is that the title had changed. The original title was Portrait of a Collector, Andrea Odoni and his Venetian Palace. And as you've seen, it's now the art collector in early modern Italy, art Andrea Odoni and his Venetian Palace. Titles are important, I'm always saying this, and I think this was a wise decision. And so that's my first question for Monica. What inspired you to change it and what is the significance of the change? And my second question concerns the order of things. I can understand that you wanted your argument to culminate with your detailed examination of Lotto's painting, but the painting is dated 1527, five years before Michiel's visit to Odoni's house, uh, a few years more be uh, before Ger uh, Girolamo da Treviso's frescoes, uh, and 11 years before Aretino's letter. Had you considered placing your discussion of the painting in the chron chronological sequence, that is, at the beginning of Odoni's art patronage than, rather than at the end? So what was your thinking here? That said, congratulations, Monica. Your book is a significant contribution to the history of collecting and Venetian art and material culture, and of course, Lotto, Lorenzo Lotto. And of course, it gives Andrea Odoni, Cittadino, if not Nobile, a significant role in the cultural history of 16th century Venice. He would be well pleased. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Patricia. It's a pleasure now to introduce David Young Kim, who is Associate Professor in Department of Art in the Department of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of The Traveling Artist in the Italian Renaissance, Geography, Mobility, and Style, and hot off the presses. He has just published a Princeton University uh, publication, Groundwork, a History of the Renaissance Picture, which seeks to develop a model for thinking about the early modern picture from the viewpoint of the ground. And of course, art historians here um, will understand ground in all of its um, uh, multiplicity of meaning there. So welcome, David. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And um, I'd like to begin by saying that um, I first um, corresponded uh, with Monica Schmitter um, when I was an undergraduate at Amherst College, I was working with Nicola Courtright, who I, whom I, who I believe is on this call. And I had some questions about um, Giorgione and uh, Monica kindly responded to all of my questions for months. And so um, I just offer that um, to emphasize uh, Monica's um, generosity, not only as a scholar, but her generosity um, as a teacher um, to students um, across the five college um, area in the Pioneer Valley. So um, as I mentioned, it's a great pleasure and honor to have been asked to respond to um, Schmitter's The Art Collector in Early Modern um, Italy, the new title we can certainly um, this, uh, discuss. Uh, this book, uh, lucidly written and rigorously archival, reveals how a case study of an individual can open up new ways of thinking and writing about immigration and social class, 
the imbrication between objects and the self, and the architectural presence of what we might call a home museum in urban space. Like the best kinds of narrative scholarship, Schmitter's book dramatizes for the reader today a virtual itinerary through time and space. As has been mentioned, after learning about the political and social norms ascribed to Odoni as a cittadino, we travel to Odoni's house located on the western part of Venice, moving from its facade to its interior spaces, and finally to Lorenzo Lotto's magnificent portrait of Adoni himself located in the Camera della Scala. This portrait is not, as is all too frequently thought, simply a testament to the passionate consumption of material things, um, nor is it just an illustration of antiquarian interest, nor is it simply a penetrating psychological portrait. As Schmitter convincingly argues, the portrait instantiates the transmutational power of art, a power that induces both reflection on and elevation of the self. One of the most exciting ideas for me is Schmitter's conception of Lotto's hieroglyphic composition, by which I mean um, the means by which the artist conjoins fragments into the wide format of the portrait in meaningful yet elusive uh, ways. And um, let me just mention as well, Monica's very interesting um, recourse to cinematic theory and thinking about the format of the portrait. This mode of conjoining um, stimulates the pleasure of thought and reflection. And as Schmitter writes on page 228 in the beautiful quote, and I quote, um, pieces and fragments are juxtaposed and combined, displaced in an aesthetic of the haphazard the chance encounter, the surprise discovery, the lifting of the veil of the tablecloth by the decapitated body and bodiless head is the ultimate staging of this kind of play, end quote. For me, an especially powerful moment in this chapter occurs when Schmitter invites us to reread the verbal description of the portrait by Marc Antonio Michiel, the 16th century Venetian uh, connoisseur who made notes on works of art located in Venice and throughout uh, Lombardy and the Veneto. And if you see my, um, my Zoom background, I've somehow in a very sacrilegious way um, appropriated um, a leaf from Marc Antonio Michele's um, Notizie. As Schmiller has demonstrated in her other publications, and here I'm thinking about her really excellent article in the Burlington Magazine, Michiel's handwritten observations on loose sheets of papers, which she compiled and revised in the course of two, decade, two decades, can be properly characterized as blending reflections on style, provenance, historical categorization, materials, techniques, and artistic collaboration. And as Schmitter um, notes, in the physical manuscript, the frequent crossing out of words, insertions, revisions and use of different inks are graphic testaments to the process whereby Michiel jogged his memory, reconsidered and worked out his responses to artworks on the folio page. And I believe you can see an example behind me. Indeed, Michiel's notes constitute the beginnings in the Venetian ambiance of an art critical lexicon mm -hmm. whose terms had not yet been consolidated and codified and are still in a very creative flux. And by the same token, we might compare Michiel's mode of memory writing to the period practice of schizzi or preparatory sketches that capture so many moments of fleeting thought. But to return to the book, Schmitter observes that Michiel first wrote that the work portrayed Odoni con, that is to say with, antique marble fragments. But then Michiel revised this initial assessment, crossing out con with and inserted above the line que contempla, who con contemplates. Drawing together this um, fine-grained archival research with philological inquiry, uh, Schmitter notes how, um, quote, the Italian verb contemplare derives from the Latin term templum, originally known as a circumscribed place used for the observation of the flight of birds. 
So what's at stake in Mikiel's correction, Schmitter proposes, is the interpretation of divine meaning through the faculty of sight. Contemplare as a term was deployed, she notes, in the 16th century to describe the act of witnessing art or beauty for the purpose of spiritual enlightenment. And so thinking about contemplation as the act of observing the flight of birds in the divinatory sense opens up reading Lotto's portrait, not simply as a visual transcription of a historical individual, but rather as a representation of a yearning self surrounded by objects who like birds are in motion, if not in flight. Indeed, the marble fragments not simply designate um, iconographic content, such as the Di Diana of Ephesus or Hercules, Hadrian, male and female bodies. These marble fragments in the portrait um, may have reached the end of their journey, perhaps from collections or direct um, exhumation from the ground, but nonetheless, they still retain their sense of motion and direction, especially the bust of Hadrian jutting through the green cloth as though a stone fragment has ascended to the water's surface in a type of marine archaeological campaign. In animating the past through three, in animating the past through deep historical research and the sensitive observation of Lotto's composition and brushwork, Schmitter's revelatory, um, revelatory work enables us to contemplate the fragment not in terms of part versus whole, but as a metaphor that through its travel depicts the panorama of Venetian Renaissance thought and the role of the self contemplating the import of works of art, just like those ancient augurs in antiquity who beheld birds crossing the sky in flight. Uh, congratulations, Monica, and um, I look very much forward to the discussion that ensues. Thank you, David, for all of that and for your beautiful background. Um, as we move in uh, or toward our conversation with the audience, I wanna remind everyone um, to feel welcome to begin posting questions. For the next five minutes, I'm gonna open it up to Monica um, for your comments and response to Pat and David. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, both of you. Um, it was, you know, you brought in so many of the things that I couldn't fit into my 10 minutes. So it worked out really well. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, I guess, Pat, that was, you gave me some direct questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and answer those. Um, first of all, the title thing, that was the Cresses idea. So they wanted to change it. And uh, I was never very happy with the original title. I felt like it mm, needed jazzing up and I didn't quite know what to do with it. So when they suggested this, I was like, okay, fine, we'll do it. And at first I felt like it was sort of like mis you know, over advertising the book because it seems to be about, you know, the collector in early, you know, just as though it's about more than it's about. Um, but in the end, I think it's actually right because really Odoni is a kind of uh, excellent example of the art collect, you know, of what an art collector in early modern Italy might be, and that that is somewhat different than one what one might expect. Um, so I'm happy with it in the end. Uh, but it wasn't actually my idea. <laughs> but I'm happy that you're happy with it too. I'm happy with it. <laughs> okay. Um, and as for the chronological, um, the issue of how I organized the chapters, I think I was always thinking so much about space and how objects work in space that that was just the fundamental way in which I conceived the book. So that it really, in it, it's not, actually the book is not so much about Odoni, who in the end is a somewhat unreachable character. I would say, I, I still feel that I, I don't know who he was in as a person in some way. Um, but really it's about this idea of presenting yourself through a house. And so, 
Yeah, so that's part of it. But I think also it would be very hard to reconstruct chronologically how he composed the collection. Um, and so what I did do, and, and I think you know this because the, the other reader for the press didn't like the fact that I didn't have, you know, that the, the, the uh, portrait was early in his collecting, but late in the book. And I, so I did address that in the book in the end by saying that, um, you know, in a way, I think it, it, it could have acted as almost a stimulus for him in terms of creating the collection that he was at the beginning of becoming a collector when he commissioned the portrait. And that, you know, I like to think of it as working sort of like a mirror for him in his bedroom there as he's looking at it that he is um, literally forming himself as a collector over time by looking into this mirror. Yeah, that makes real sense to me. And you know what I was thinking as you were talking, like who, who saw the portrait other than him? He probably invited friends into the bedroom because these bedrooms were not just bedrooms uh, at that time. And um, it, you know, what inspired, how did Mikiel know about his place? So somebody was knowing something, you know, going on at that time. And um, it was, uh, it, it's very interesting. I mean, it's a personal thing and yet other people clearly would have seen it. Oh, I, I think so. I mean, you know, and the fact that Mikiel has the, you know, room by room, and it's the only collection that he visited that he described room by room, really suggests um, to me also that Odoni is, you know, making, as David says, a kind of house museum here. You know, this is, this is really for display. And Aretino's letter yeah. sort of insinuates that the house is a little bit too much for display, you know, um, and that that might not be so proper in some way. Yeah. Great. So David, um, yes, I love your background. I know that we share a great affection for Miguel um, and his terrible handwriting and all of his corrections and all of that. And um, I just wanna thank you so much for your uh, kind of poetic response to my project. And um, I like that idea you had particularly of the creative flux uh, that is going on at this moment in time. Um, where, you know, collecting is really just coming into uh, formation. As, I mean, it was around earlier, certainly collecting, but I think this kind of public projection of collecting as an activity um, that even could be, um, you know, a, a, a public work of art. You know, even though it's a, it's a private house, I think that he is, you know, also with a flashy facade, you know, there's a certain kind of here it is, here I am, this is my uh, fancy house. And I think this is what leads Aretino to be slightly critical of it. But I think what's interesting is that Lotto wants to make of this a very positive um, activity, you know, so that's almost like an opposite view and that really gets to this issue um, I saw in the question and answer already, one of the questions about consumption, about the tensions about consumption um, in this period, you know, that you, uh, obviously these are status symbols and very valuable objects that Ordoni has around him, but somehow they are, that's not enough or that's not, um, all they are, they have to be something more than that. And the cross that he holds is really key to the whole painting. Although of course it was not seen, it had been painted over in the 1950s. It was only rediscovered in 1997 when the painting was cleaned. And so that changes the whole way you have to think about the portrait, of course, if you have the cross there in the center. Um, and so, uh, I always had this feeling that there wasn't really an opposition going on, but that um, rather it's more like a, a kind of circle with wheels that all go back to this central hub at the cross. You have a you have a whole forum of questions, Monica, in the Q and A. Shall I shall I open? Yes, it? please. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so from Sarah Horowitz, we have, um, can you speak more about the architectural spaces where Odoni housed and displayed his collections? She's ex especially curious about the intersections between Renaissance collecting practices and architectural theories about ordering space at this time. She's thinking of the um, Serlio. Sir, 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 sir yeah, <laughs> Serlio. Uh -huh. Okay, there it is. Uh, plans that you showed. Can you speak more about the architectural spaces where Odoni housed it? I'm especially curious about the intersections between Renaissance collecting practices and architectural theories about ordering space at this time. Hmm, Sarah, thank you so much for that collection. That uh, question, um, collection, I have collections on my mind. Um, hmm, that is an interesting, I, you know, the problem is always when you study the 16th century that the first half of the 16th century is really different from the second half of the 16th century. So the second half of the 16th century, which is more when Serlio is writing, and Serlio is really the earliest one to maybe systematize this way of thinking about spaces in architectural theory. Um, there isn't really something, so I would say the practice precedes the theorization, right? So there's a, the beginning of the practicing of using these spaces in certain ways, and then that gets programmatized in the books like Serlio's um, or and idealized. And then that in turn can influence the way that spaces are made. But I see the period when Odoni is collecting and displaying where these things are not, there are practices, but they are not theorized. I don't know, Pat, whether you have a thought about that. Well, I was just thinking, I mean, the most obvious example is the Grimani collection, okay? So they, the, and they're working on the Grimani palace in the, I would say probably in the 1530s, late 1530s, um, where you have uh, your Giovanni da Udine, you know, frescoing ceilings and so on. And that was really, that that house was really reorganized for this huge Grimati collection. And so, uh, I mean, it would be interesting to compare that, compare, I mean, that's been written about quite a bit, comparing it to your book and our little Odoni there with what he's doing. Uh, he's, a front run, he's a front runner with that. Um, I think a lot of it was just kind of, you um, uh, these things grew by themselves, you know, as they went along and then it became more systematized later on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how it, uh, you know, Serlio, he would have things like this is, I, I, I don't think he had special spaces, spaces for antiquities or anything like that. It was more for sleeping and, and these, these camere were, were multi-purpose rooms really. Uh, but but it's an interesting. I think what's interesting with Odoni is that you have a an itinerary. You know, you go in. Here's you know here's all this stuff uh, on the ground floor antiquities, and then you go up into the into the house, and you have more of a mixture of things and uh, things that say tell us something else. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the Grimani collection is similar that way. I mean, it's a huge big thing, but. Um, you know, it, it, they lead you through, there's, there's a path, you know, you go through the house and you're supposed to experience it in a certain mm -hmm. way. So that would be the one obvious comparison. Uh, but you know, our, our Ordoni is at the beginning of that, I think. I mean, it's before, before Palazzo Grimani. Yeah, that's, that's what I would say, but things move very quickly, you know, so it's, it's, it's. Yeah, and I, yeah word of mouth and, you know, yeah. Yeah. Monica, do we have another question? Uh, do we have any information about how Odoni obtained his antiquities? In particular, can any be traced to Ottoman territories obtained by agents, anything from ch by chance, um, organized excav excavations, for instance? Hmm. Very good question, wouldn't I like to know? Um, <laughs> so, you know, all I can do is kind of theorize on the basis of whatever, you know, other examples survive. Um, there, you know, the Venetians definitely got antiquities from their uh, territories in Greece and in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
So, uh, and the fact that Odoni worked for the wine taxing office, thanks for bringing that up because I didn't get to that in my own talk, um, would have meant that he had a lot of access to boats coming from lots of different places. And so, you know, were there also some other things on the boat? You know, that seems very plausible to me. Um, in fact, I would say probably the maybe the most likely, but this is just a guess. But some works definitely also came from the mainland of Italy and were um, found and excavated there and then brought to Venice. Um, so, but I don't know anything specific about Odoni's actual objects. One thing that came to my mind and is a question Pari is asking tonight also mm. are about um, the, the Wunderkammers, right? Mm. And so um, mm. are Odoni's house and his collection connected to part mm. of the larger umbrella of cabinets of curiosity? Mm. And then I might just add to that, Monica, this idea of the invention of the collector and that kind of meta commentary on collecting. Can you put that together with this other, um, uh, tr you know, tradition of these, of the Wunderkammers mm. that are mm. happening? Yeah, so um, I'm going to say the same thing again, is that Odoni is at the very be beginning of things, you know, um, so there are really not that many examples of collectors of naturalia before him. Um, so, uh, and I think it is very interesting that he had those two, you know, so it's not just about antiquities, it's not just about, um, uh, about art. Um, so, and in fact, in the portrait, and I didn't get to this, but on the, over on the right-hand side there, there's a little porcelain cup and some pearls. And I go into a long and detailed discussion, which I don't have time for here about what they're doing there, but they're, they're related to this idea of nature, right? So it's not just art, but, you know, the connection between art and nature is of course, very important. And this idea of things being nature things being transformed into other things. And so, uh, I, yeah, so I'm not quite sure where to end with this, but to get back to what you were saying, um, yeah, the, uh, so it's, it's not a systematic, camera, uh, Kunstkammer in any way, shape or form. It is little of this and little of that. It's meant to be looked at really in com combination with works of art. I was gonna say one, another figure yeah. contemporary to him is Maureen Sunudo. You know, we mm -hmm. have, it, there were descriptions of his, I don't think he called it a studiolo, but it was the whole top floor of his house. He has all kinds of stuff like that and, you know, mm -hmm. a mapamondo and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So he was, there was probably a, a, quite a circle of men, at, you know, at that time who were, um, you know, collecting oddities, you know, curiosities, like you said, and naturalia and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So he, he ain't the only one, but, uh, but, you know, there's not a lot of evidence about it. Yeah, we have more evidence about him than we have about most. Of, so that then you get to the problem of the evidence, you know, like you have what you have, you know, and uh, it's hard to say uh, how unique someone is because you're dealing with the early 16th century where the record is simply, you know. Fragments, fragments. Yeah, fragments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you try to make something out of, you know, or understand, but obviously there are issues. You know? You've done that, Monica. Yeah. You've done a very good job of that. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, David had occasion this evening to uh, share with the audience um, something that all of us at UMass know about you, which is um, your incredible generosity as a teacher and a colleague. And so on that, I wanna ask you a question that's asking about your teaching. Um, <laughs> So John Garton asks, for those of us who teach a Renaissance, a European Renaissance survey, what key points about Lorenzo Lato as a painter and as a portraitist would you emphasize in an undergraduate course? 
Uh, well, curiously, I never teach Lorenzo Lotto. <laughs> uh, so I wish I, I could, I would, I do, but I don't. Um, so that's a hard question for me to answer. Um, I guess my bottom line was don't buy the don't buy the line that he is just a kind of naturalistic or um, uh, you know very pious and uh, you know he's a, he's actually a lot more complicated than that and in fact I have to say I kind of went kicking and screaming down the path of his interests because I was not really that interested in alchemy when I started this project but um, so how would I talk about I mean I think you have to think of him as someone who is a little bit of an outsider too, you know, who's taking a very different path, but he's taking it for a purpose and he has certain kinds of convictions. And maybe this gives me an opportunity to say something a little bit more about what I hope will be my next project, which is to look at actually different, uh, several different portraitists, different artists who painted portraits in the early, in the first half of the 16th century to really think about how do they, think about self, about creating selves on canvas um, and the strategies that they use to do that. And I think that Lotto has a particular way of doing that, which is often about um, something elusive, something that seems, you know, that complicates, uh, that does not give you uh, a straight simple depiction of the person. And I think that's partly why Odoni is hard to get a grip on is because the, the portrait actually deliberately makes him a little bit difficult to get a grip on. Um, so, you know, I, I compare in the book, I compare Odoni's portrait to Raphael's portrait of Castiglione in part because they were both in the same Dutch collection in the 17th century. So I kind of imagine them side by side. And, you know, as I say in the book that, you know, Castiglione is like, you know, your uh, high school yearbook picture in comparison, right? It's meant to be sort of a, a fairly understandable image of this self. And I don't think that's what's going on with Lotto. It's fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating to try to teach the exception, right? In an undergraduate course, and then to think about portraiture. Woo, it's hot, that would be, but it's great. It seems like rich territory. Um, well, I think we're coming close to the end of our conversation. Um, and so I want to thank Patricia and David for your generosity of engagement with Monica's beautiful book tonight. Um, our thanks to the audience for attending and your um, wonderful questions. We didn't get to all of them, but we will save them in the chat for Monica. Um, to HFA for organizing this event um, and Monica, Congratulations on this extraordinary publication. It was a pleasure to hear about and speak with you tonight. Uh, so, so thank you and good night. <laughs> okay, thank you all so much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, David. Wow, oh, Monica. See you, see you in Venice with uh, with the spritz very soon. I hope. Yeah, very soon. Right. All <laughs> of us, maybe all three of us. All no, of us. Don't we all <laughs> wish? Marjorie, you yeah. should come too. Okay, yeah. sir, sure. Yeah. I'll take a spritz yeah. any day. Campo Santa Margarita, six weeks. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao. Ciao, everyone. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.